So good afternoon, welcome everyone. Uh, my name's James uh, and my talk today is Don't Outgrow Your Technology. Uh, now I'm told we have to make a prompt finish at 3.15, um, but there will be some time for some questions at the end. Um, please do ask them uh, in the chat as we go along and I'll try and answer as many as we can. So a little bit about me, uh, I've been in IT for 20 years. Uh, in a range of roles, including frontline network support, uh, technical architecture, uh, project engineering, and also IT leadership roles. Um, I'm the managing director and principal consultant here at Lucid. Um, and as a result, I'm really privileged to work with a range of customers, including some of the UK's best known organizations. What my work does is it gives me a unique insight into businesses who range from a handful of users right up to tens of thousands of IT users uh, across different geographies. And I get to see how they're using technology. And in many cases, uh, I and my team directly help them use that technology better, quicker and more securely. One of the things I really like doing is talking to businesses like yours at events like this uh, about some of my insights from that work. Now, I'm IT infrastructure focused, uh, but the principles I'm talking about here can be transferred to, to virtually any decision about technology purchases. So a little bit about my company, uh, we're an IT consultancy, uh, we're based in Manchester um, and we specialise in designing and supporting IT uh, infrastructure across numerous different sectors. Um, we were founded in 2011 uh, and we have, uh, we have an office here in Manchester and we also have one in Edinburgh. Um, and we help businesses who rely on technology to, to manage and support their critical systems, uh, whether that's in the data centre uh, or on premise or in the cloud. So we're here today to talk about how not to outgrow your technology. Um, people outgrow their technology, businesses outgrow their technology for a variety of reasons. Um, but one very common reason is because they've underinvested in technology early on. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. I see technology as an opportunity to invest, uh, not a cost to be minimized. Um, in today's world, business relies on technology. And the last six months have been a really great example of that. Um, Technology can give you a competitive advantage. Um, it can, uh, for example, allow you to scale in the cloud um, when keep your costs low, when you're not needing that capacity. Um, you can improve productivity, um, and that's generally by automating away those boring or repetitive tasks. Technology can help you attract and retain the best talent. Now, our colleagues who are entering the workplace at the start of their careers from education, they expect to work hard, but in return, they expect to use the latest tools, they expect to work from anywhere, and they expect to work when it suits them. Um, overall, technology should make life better. It, it's a tool, use it to make work easier and make you work less. And I believe that if a business doesn't take the opportunity to invest in technology, it's missing the opportunity to do all of these things. So as an SME business, before you spend any money on technology, um, I'd advise you to do three things. So the first is to think carefully and align your IT strategy to your organization's goals. So that could be growth, expansion, uh, company vision, uh, it could be green policies. Um, and then use the results of that thought process to plan uh, and work out what, tech need, te what technology you're going to need and when. Um, and when you have that plan in place and you're just executing the plan as you grow, that makes it much easier and much more effective to invest in technology. Um, now, you can get help with both of these things by engaging with an expert. So I'd recommend that you find somebody who's got experience of technology and business um, who can be a trusted advisor to your business. Um, they need to understand technology and business because they need to understand your business um, and what you're trying to achieve. And that's mostly not a technical conversation. Look for somebody with really great communication skills. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so look for somebody with really great communication skills. Uh, when people talk about technology, uh, there can often be misunderstandings about terms. People use the same word and they mean different things. Uh, people use different words to mean the same thing. Um, and the sector's riddled with jargon. So an independent expert will really help you cut through that. Um, they will also have a level of focus that as a business owner, it can be quite hard to achieve because the owner manager of an SME business is, is in the business day to day. And, 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 and that, a number of pressures come along with that, which means that they're often not best placed to be making uh, technology strategy decisions. Now, 
a good advisor can see into the future. Now, well, of course they can't really, um, but someone who's seen everything before will be able to predict the pitfalls and they'll be able to give you the benefit of their experience. Um, and finally, a good advisor will fill a gap. Now, in smaller businesses, there's often a knowledge gap, as we call it. Um, the founders and senior staff end up making technology purchasing decisions, um, but they lack the time and headspace uh, or the overview of the market uh, to make the best choices. And as a result, uh, they often end up making perhaps the lowest cost choice uh, or the quickest choice. And those aren't necessarily the optimum one. So to, to bring this to life as an example, um, I'm going to talk about an organization that we've worked with who are a recruitment agency. Um, they started as two people 10 years ago, um, and now they've grown to over 50 people uh, with a multi-million pound turnover uh, in, in several countries. Now they worked out relatively early on that they had a knowledge gap um, and they, they engaged with us to, to, to help them design their IT technology strategy. Now, right at the beginning, uh, they had their aims were to have low total cost of ownership, and that's something that we'll talk about shortly, um, but the ability to scale up rapidly. Um, and bear in mind, this is 10 years ago, so uh, the cloud options that were available back then were much more limited. Um, now that they're an established business, um, they've, they've moved to the cloud because the, 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 the cloud landscape has moved on and has developed. Um, but back then, they had a, a solution that was based around on-premise server systems, uh, using remote desktop because that's allowed them to, 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 to add users at a very low and predictable cost. Um, and now as they developed, um, they're almost exclusively running SharePoint, OneDrive, uh, and their line of business applications are all in the cloud as well. The other type of gap is what we call a people gap. So in larger businesses, this people gap exists between uh, the, the board of directors um, and the IT team. So it can be very challenging in larger organizations for technical people in the IT team uh, to talk effectively to people who are in the senior leadership team. Um, they fundamentally don't talk the same language. Um, it's often quite challenging for people in the senior leadership team to understand the tech um, and uh, technical people can sometimes have difficulty having uh, sort of financial or economic conversations um, about budgets and things like that with the senior leadership team. Um, and that causes a lack of understanding and, and the, the, those, those people can't communicate ideas to each other as effectively as they might do. So another example here is uh, a co another company we work for who are, who are larger, they're 240 million pounds turnover, um, 700 users uh, across the UK. and uh, we became involved with them when they were about to make a, a spend of about £180,000 on some disk storage. And that decision was driven by the IT department. Um, so what we did is we, we, we mapped out their actual requirements and uh, we did that by brokering and by having conversations with the IT team and with the board. And we actually identified that there were, there were potentially three solutions in the market that would have done what they wanted um, at significantly lower cost than the amount of budget that had notionally been set aside. Um, and in the end, they, they went for a solution that cost about £70,000, which gave them enough storage to last two or three years, but crucially gave them access to inexpensive upgrades afterwards. Um, so just by having those conversations and by having effective communication between the financial decision makers and the technical people, uh, they managed to save £110,000 plus much more later, um, but crucially without losing that ability to grow. <clears throat> So we've talked a little about some ways to plan your technology investment by, by planning effectively. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how not to waste money on technology that doesn't scale. So we briefly touched on total cost of ownership in an earlier slide. Now, total cost of ownership is this idea that um, it's not just the initial purchase price of, of a technology investment uh, that, that's important. Um, we need to consider the entire cost of that investment over its full lifetime. So uh, that might include uh, costs for supporting the system. Do, do, you have to, uh, do you have to hire in any specialist skills or do you have to skill up somebody in your team? Um, or do you have to outsource that support in some way? Um, how much power does it consume? Um, perhaps there might be a warranty or a license renewal that, that you have to renew every year or every three years. Um, and 
does the system have enough capacity sort of headroom for expansion and, and how much is that going to cost later on so if you make a technology investment based on uh, what your business is doing today if your business scales up rapidly are you going to have to throw away that investment in three years or, or possibly even less um, and, and of course you've also got to config, consider the entire lifespan of the investment so is it something that's going to need replacing in three or five or ten years so this idea of, of, of thinking about total cost of ownership or TCO is that you're, you're balancing the initial investment cost um, versus the, the, the whole lifetime expenditure of the solution. So an example of, uh, of, of a, a technology investment paying off when the, the company looked at TCO, um, another company that we know of um, were comparing uh, some Cisco firewalls with uh, competing low cost products. Now, Cisco was by far the highest cost option that was on the table. Um, but uh, after choosing it, uh, four years later, that customers had zero faults or downtime. And there's still five or six years left of life in that system. And because they chose to go for two of those systems, um, there's now plenty of spare capacity um, and maintenance can be done in the day. So that means that they're saving on support costs because they don't have to pay people overtime to do that maintenance outside office hours. What our system allowed them to do is respond to the unexpected events that happened earlier this year, uh, and they transitioned 250 staff to working from home really, really quickly and efficiently and without any major business disruption. So although they were making a costly investment, and um, that customers gained significant long-term value from that. So the main way to avoid uh, to, to, to avoid getting locked into tech is, is to get your building blocks right. Um, and we approach everything from the, the point of view of these, the, these building blocks, which are scalable. Um, in today's world, mostly all you need to run a successful business is a, a good quality business grade internet connection, a high speed wired and wireless network um, and to run your commodity services in the cloud. So when we say commodity services, we're talking about things like email here, and web hosting. Um, there's really no reason to be running those services in house these days. Um, when you've got cloud services, you've got good Internet connection, you've got fast network. Um, you may have a niche need like video editing, for example, which means that you can then easily add in some server infrastructure to meet that need. But when you have these building blocks in place, you can add more of them easily uh, and you can scale up on demand very quickly. So an example of this um, from a company that we've come into contact with was a motor dealership. Um, they were started out as two people selling cars from a very small dealership in uh, just outside Edinburgh. Um, they engaged with us when they were starting out and uh, they, we designed a scalable IT infrastructure for them that would see them up until their maximum number of people at that site, which was about six people. Um, but the critical thing was that, that we got these building blocks right and the customer got these building blocks right. So uh, some years down the road, when a time limited opportunity presented itself uh, for them to take over another dealership, they were able to respond to that. Uh, so this was a dealership that was about to cease trading um, uh, it was much larger than they were, so they were three sites. Um, you know, one of the showrooms was capable of, uh, of holding 30 vehicles um, with over 60 people in the group. Uh, and they were able to very quickly scale up and absorb this much larger organization because they had the right technology infrastructure in place. So finally, in this section, I'd like to talk about uh, avoiding technology lock-in. So this is a common pitfall for smaller businesses who are understandably very cost focused. Um, maybe the purchasing decisions are made by founders of the business or, or other senior staff who might not have a technology background. Um, they might be making decisions quickly, uh, valuing speed over other factors. Now, uh, by looking only at the headline price, it's possible to fall into the trap of getting locked into some technology. And a really good example of this is, uh, which, which I think most people will be able to relate to, is um, if we consider uh, editions of Windows 10. So uh, Microsoft Windows comes in a number of flavors. It comes in the home edition, uh, which is aimed at domestic users, professional edition, which is aimed at sort of small to medium sized businesses. And there's an enterprise edition as well. that's aimed at much larger organizations. Now, Windows 10 home edition, um, ships with many PCs as, as Windows does um, and it has a very low headline cost 
Um, and what you will quite often find is that PCs that ship with Windows 10 Home Edition um, are significantly lower cost than, than the ones that ship with the Professional Edition. Um, the problem is that that low headline cost is in return for fewer features. So uh, critically, it can't join a business network, uh, it doesn't have disk encryption, and you can't apply mobile device management. Now, all of these are fairly critical features if you're working in a post-GDPR world in any business. Um, so your only recourse there is to either upgrade to the professional edition, which costs much more to do later than it would to, to have bought it at the outset, um, or, or to replace the machine. Um, and that means your initial investment there is wasted uh, and you have some additional costs also. So we've talked a bit about how to avoid technology lock-in and to how to avoid wasting money on technology. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit now about the risk of sweating your assets. So sweating assets is this idea that we, we leave in place our older technology investments instead of replacing them when we originally thought we were going to. And we try and squeeze an, a few more months or possibly even years in some cases of life out of those investments. Now, it used to be common for IT infrastructure and networks to be built with plenty of redundancy, two or more of all the critical components. So if one fails, that, that doesn't impact on service and plenty of spare capacity overhead designed in at the start. Now that spare capacity was really important because it gave networks and businesses the ability to accommodate temporary spikes in demand um, or to withstand unexpected failures. Now in recent years, businesses have pursued efficiency to try and lower their costs. And that's resulted in much of the spare capacity uh, that used to exist in networks and technology infrastructure no longer being spare. It's actually an active and regular use. So the effect of that is that networks and infrastructure function okay under normal conditions, but when an unexpected event occurs, the system or network fails to perform as expected or, or it may fail entirely. Now, the recent lockdown where much of the UK had to change their working practices really quickly is a good illustration of this. And many companies found earlier this year that they were either not equipped for the sudden need to work from home, um, or if they did have the infrastructure in place, uh, it didn't perform well enough. Now, unexpected events are by definition unpredictable, but when we're investing in technology, we can help mitigate that by ensuring that we have enough headroom for expansion designed into our solutions from the outset. Um, and, and that'll help businesses react much better to unforeseen events in the future. So moving on, I'd like to talk a little about the potential risks of still running legacy technology. Now, this is how things look for a lot of SME organizations today. Many are still running legacy software platforms like Windows 7 or 8 um, or unsupported versions of applications. Um, many are slow to adopt cloud services and um, perhaps still running traditional on-premise back office systems. Um, the technology strategy might be confused or scattered um, with widespread usage of employees of own mobile devices, uh, maybe purchasing decisions made on the spot or on a reactive basis. Um, and security and collaboration solutions are a, a bit of a patchwork in some businesses uh, with several different solutions deployed um, in, in, in an overlapping way that, that, that partially address parts of their needs. And that, that infrastructure means things are becoming more fragmented as those businesses attempt to improve their productivity by deploying a new solution, um, but also while trying to work within budget constraints. Um, and the irony is that that fragmentation actually means they're spending more money um, and not really getting a return on that by making more profit. So um, when businesses add new services in this way to fill in these gaps, they're, they're holding on to these legacy systems that they perceive as good enough. But those systems take up more time to manage um, and that also impacts on profit margins. So a few stats here about using legacy technology. Um, according to the National Cyber Security Centre, 88% um, of all cyber attacks are opportunist and low skilled. Now what that means is that you're attacked because you're vulnerable um, and, and it's not a targeted attack, you're attacked because you're vulnerable. And, and often that's, not, that, that, that's due to out-of-state software that has security vulnerabilities in it. Following on from that, the average cost of a data breach in an SMB organization um, can be as much as £90,000. And that doesn't include loss of reputation or loss of client trust. Um, 
and quite an alarming statistic that surprised me even is that uh, eighty five percent of small businesses that that that, that have PCs um, have PCs which are four years old or more. Now the cost of running a computer uh, that's a single PC that's more than four years old, um, according to Tech Isle, and these the, the, the stats perhaps a year and a half out of date now, um, is over eighteen hundred pounds. Now that's more than five times the cost of buying a modern PC. So even on a technology investment as small as a PC, it's easy to see how trying to sweat that asset and use it for longer can actually cost much more than just simply replacing with something more modern. So an example of this uh, from another organization that we're familiar with, um, they are a 30 person accountancy practice. Um, so earlier this year in January, um, they they approached us. They they were still running Windows Seven, um, substantially across their all, their entire infrastructure. Uh, that went end of life in the middle of January. Um, their IT infrastructure was basically at capacity, um, and they we worked with them to help them upgrade to a modern desktop uh, and cloud applications in late January and early February. Uh, now, as it turned out, that happened to be just in time for the coronavirus. Uh, and they were in a position where everyone in the business did and now does work from home uh, predominantly. Um, and they've actually managed to reduce their requirement for office space, saving costs in the process. So in summary, uh, we've talked about how technology is an opportunity to invest. Uh, it can help you attract the best talent. Um, it can help you uh, make, make, make your work, work and life better and easier. Um, before you spend money on technology, um, think, plan, um, and if required, engage with an expert. Try not to waste money on technologies that don't scale. So uh, understand uh, understand TCO, um, get your building blocks right, um, avoid technology lock-in, um, and beware of sweating your assets. Um, so do you have capacity when the unexpected happens? Um, and, and understand the risks of, of running legacy technology longer than you need to, um, of, which are often to do with security. So thanks for listening. Um, if anybody has any questions, please do post them in the chat. Um, and if you'd like to carry on the conversation offline, um, then my contact details are here. Yeah, please connect with me on LinkedIn.